Hi, Gina. Hi, Christina. Okay, so I have to tell you a funny story that happened yesterday before we dive into things today. So, you know, it's getting dark early and we're a really active family. So sometimes it's kind of hard staying inside for like the extended winter hours. And so we decided to go to an amusement park yesterday after school that we have like year passes to. So it's free basically um, or free when we go. And so we went and my daughter, my six-year-old daughter, almost seven, is like, oh my gosh, I can't wait to go on this roller coaster. We went on the roller coaster last time and she loved it. And she's like, clearly like the energy in the, you know, endorphins are pumping through her. She's jumping around as we get into the park and my son is getting all amped up because of it. And he's very timid. He never goes on roller coasters. And so he's like, I'm going to go too, because his little sister is going on. So he's all amped up, right? So we get on the roller coaster, there's nobody in line and we get on and immediately the roller coaster starts going tick, 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 going up. I don't know what happened, but a switch went off in my daughter. All of a sudden she's like, I don't want to be here anymore. I don't want this. Like screaming. And she is loud and she's really strong and she's really intense. And she's starting to pay, full on panic attack at the very, very, very beginning of this roller coaster. The first roller coaster, my son, who's much more sensitive and timid in the row behind us is on with us. He's sitting with my husband. She's having a full blown panic attack. Then we, we get to the top and this huge dip happens right away. And it actually goes into water. And so we, she's screaming bloody murder. We make it down the tip. She literally tries to get out of the roller coaster, literally tries to stand up because she's having a full blown, like uncontrollable panic attack. And I'm just like, Sassy, Sassy, it's okay. Mommy's here. I'm trying to calm her down because clearly she is just out of her mind with anxiety or whatever's going through her. <laughs> Gina. So then this is not the end of the roller coaster, right? It's a, it's a water coaster, right? So then there's like a, I know the one you're talking about. It's like a slow boat through into the next part. So it's the most treacherous slow minutes. Yes. And then we go up and, um, it was absolutely awful. Like from complete excitement and we're, oh well, we finally did it. Like our kids can go on roller coasters. This is awesome. To this horrible experience. I just had to really calm her down and, and just, I was like, look me in the eye. I had to get her, look me in the eye. Mommy's not going to let anything happen to you. I put my arm around her. I'm like, just put your head here. But actually for the first minute or so, she wouldn't even let me calm her down. She was like, <sighs> it was wild. So then my son starts crying. <laughs> We get off of this coaster. Both of them are crying. It was terrible. I feel like I still have like PTSD from the whole experience because there's something so unnatural about seeing your child freak out like that and know that you can't do anything about it. So I oh had just had God. to kind of find my calm in my center and try to be that space for her. But it was so intense. Oh my God. I just... <laughs> I can just feel it. I can feel everything she was feeling, like the excitement, almost like, you know, the buildup was so much. But Hayden did the same thing on that roller coaster. We'd gone on it two or three times. And the last time it was getting towards the end of the day and Bill wasn't on with us this last time. And we did wait in line a little bit. And we got up to the front of the line and she's like, I don't want to do it. She had already done it three times. And she mm. was just like, I don't want to do it and say we had to just we walked away so I but even then she started crying and was like no you can't make me I'm like I'm not gonna make you I'm just <laughs> saying you've already done this if, like right so oh my god the panic oh my gosh and my son is just like I'm never going he's crying I'm never going on a roller coaster oh. again I felt bad for him and so with some time I was like hey do you think that maybe if your sister wasn't so upset it would have been more exciting for you you know like trying to throw that possibility in there help him rationalize a little bit but yeah that happened oh, oh my gosh and so how was it after was she okay after or was it like done it they've been talking about it ever since you know this morning they wanted to watch the roller coaster pov video on youtube and kind of like i think they're just processing the whole experience and i just keep reminding Ceci, like you've done this before remember and you did it again and you're okay both times right and she's like yeah um yeah they're just talking about it a lot because it freaked them out I feel like that's so nice to like for them to have that trauma 
and then to like have a safe space to be able to process it and, you know, not feel ashamed because they were scared. But oh my God, Christina, I can't, I can't even imagine like once you're on the like not uh, so oh unexpected experience like two parents like oh, our kids want to go you know and we're the oh it's empty there so we're the only ones on the coaster there's nobody else <laughs> and we're just it took a turn like so fast so all that's right all I have to I, share with you. it's so funny christina i have a story kind of similar where my mom actually lost her shit on a roller coaster and we were already on it it was the pirates of the caribbean and uh the uh at disneyland oh no sorry what is the pirate is that the pirate one yeah yeah so it has a bunch of dips swear to god every time she would just sit there and she'd be squeezing my hand to death and i'm a teenager i was 16 she's holding my hand she's like oh my god oh my god oh my god oh my god it's coming it's coming oh my god it's coming because it's dark and you don't know what's coming and then we dip she'd go ah! she'd throw herself on the floor and curl up in a ball and then we'd hit and then she'd sit back up every single time. There are so many times you just traverse and dip. And every time it was the same thing over and over. And I just, I mean, it's one thing cause it's my mom, another with your kids, right? Because they are little and like you would think, Oh, they, they don't know any better, but my mom is like a grown ass woman. That's hilarious. And she was <laughs> so very scared but Aww. I think that it, it's so funny that you bring up that story besides the fact that it just happened yesterday in that you know we're talking today about being your own safe space how to be a safe space for yourself and I think it's really natural for us to be a safe space for other people even yeah. as a 16 year old I knew how to support my mom and to hold her just like you did your kids and tell her you're going to be okay. It's fine, mom. It's We're safe. It's, people don't die on this roller coaster. Everything's okay, right? And for you to just step into that moment where, because you could step into the, oh my God, I'm mortified. Or what's wrong with you? You've done this before and blaming her. And instead you stepped into the moment of being there to support and nurture her and create comfort. So that now your kids can talk about it comfortably. They're like, okay, well, you know, we're going to try again. Like they're ramping themselves up again to be ready for it, right? They're like mentally processing and preparing. Except for Joaquin. He's like, never again. <laughs> he's made up his mind, but yes, totally. <laughs> yeah. When he's a teenager and there's girls involved, things will change. Totally. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Get some girls in there. Yeah. <laughs> but how do we do that for ourselves? You know, we're on that roller coaster. We're on those roller coasters every day with emotions and experiences and choices and things that are going on in our lives. And who's that safe space for us? And it's okay to have other people for that, but that doesn't, that doesn't have the longevity. You can't, people, people aren't always going to be there. And it's not even reasonable to expect other people to always hold that space for us. Totally. That's what I was thinking as you were saying that. I'm like, yes, we do have a tendency to want to be that safe space for other people, but we also subconsciously expect that from others as well. We want to see, feel seen. We want to feel validated. We want to feel loved. And not that we don't deserve all that from others because we definitely do. But I think a question that we can begin to ask ourselves when we're noticing that we don't feel safe with our family or friends or loved ones, or, you know, we want a little bit more out of our relationships. Maybe we can start to ask ourselves, am I a safe space for myself? And so it's going to be fun diving into some questions we can explore and some tips that, you know, we can offer to create this inner sanctuary so that when we're on our own roller coasters, when we're losing our shit, when when we're, you know, the clink, 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 clink up to the top of the roller coasters happening and we're really overwhelmed, we can be strong and we can get through it by diving more into our inner sanctuary instead of expecting and demanding others to completely hold that responsibility for us. Yeah. It's, and it's something I think you have to cultivate. Yeah. 
and, and really intentionally know that you deserve to feel safe. And you can take actions and choices, mindset work, healing, all the different tools. There's so many different ways. But I, I, this comes back to something I feel like we talk about a lot is that receiving, you know, the being willing to receive. You've got to be willing. You've got to be willing to receive it for yourself, not just when other people are willing to give it, but like that giving it to ourselves, kind of like getting a pedicure or a massage feels so indulgent. And I think this is such a subconscious way that we almost deprive ourselves of that comfort because we're so busy trying to be something, trying to support everybody else. And I think it misses the radar sometimes. I think that because I've just been exploring this question a lot for myself lately. And I've realized as I've done my own healing journey and, you know, I've broken down a lot of my own inner barriers. I've kind of come to this realization that a lot of the blocks come from safety. And that kind of makes sense because the ego's mind is all around survival. It's all about safety. It's about keeping us safe. So we don't realize until we take the time to pay attention how much of that is running us subconsciously and we we can be in this perpetual state of like not feeling safe. And so when we start to cultivate a safe space on the inside for ourselves, it's really powerful and things really start moving and energy starts flowing. And so I think that one of the best way or one of the first ways that we can begin to cultivate this own inner haven, this inner sanctuary is by allowing all the feelings to be right. So if you're feeling really, really scared, let's use the, let's continue with this roller coaster for a minute. And you know, you're really overwhelmed and you're like, Oh my God, what did I get myself into? There's no backing out now. You know, maybe you got a promotion and you're scared. You feel really overwhelmed. You're like, not sure if, if this is, if you can do it, just allowing that feeling in your body and in those thoughts sometimes to be for a moment like have their space to express can really be much more powerful than just trying to push through it. And the reason I think is because when we allow it to work its way through our body, the, through the feelings, through the energy, through maybe even through our thoughts, it goes faster. When we repress something and try to cover it up, it stays, it doesn't go anywhere. It just stays around, you know, a lot longer, I think. Yeah. Well, if you're not acknowledging it, then you're not dealing with it. And if you're not dealing with it, it lingers, right? It's not having its moment because it is communicating with you. It's telling you there's something here you feel afraid of, right? There's something here that doesn't feel safe. I'm thinking like, think about new relationships or if you've been hurt really bad in a relationship, and you get into a new relationship, how many times, right? Call it baggage, call it whatever you want. But those feelings from what your past experiences are carry into this new experience, which has nothing on it. It is such a clean slate. And all of a sudden we've written things on this chalkboard that are, oh, I can't trust. I can't always trust, or I'm not sure. Or, and then it becomes unsafe. And so those things really will continue to repeat as patterns until we give them the attention they need to be able to look at, okay, why don't I trust? And, and I, I love, I'm really feeling this as you're talking about the safety aspect, how much of that happens, even not in our thoughts, but our actual nervous system is triggered. And it's like, what do you do with that? What do you do when you just don't feel safe and then you don't even know why? I mean, that's like a, a whole other thing is that in your body, what your body does around that lack of safety. Yeah. And I think that's why it's important to understand and become aware of it. Because when you can become aware of it, then you're attaching to it less. It can be this thing that it's happening to you, but it's not all of you. It's 
outside of you. Let's put, let's compartmentalize things for a moment so that we can make sense of it. Right. And so when we can say, okay, I understand that I have a lot of fear around this situation. If, if you attach to it, the fear will, will take you for a ride. The fear will control your actions. The fear will control your tra trajectory. But if we can see it as something outside of ourselves and create the safe space within ourselves to say, Hey, this thing is happening inside of me. It's okay. I see what's going on here. I'm going to attempt to the best of my current abilities to not let this fear take me to, or for a ride and understand that it's just one small part of me. But if you don't feel safe in yourself, if you don't feel like you can do that for yourself, then every fearful emotion will control you, right? And they control us subconsciously. Yeah. They, they control how we show up. Like you said, how we act. Um, just the other day, you and I were chatting, we were supposed to record and then I was having a moment. And so you took time and sat with me and talked about it. You're like, you do the beautiful thing you do where you just smile and look like, you know, something and invite me to <laughs> talk if, if I want to. And I was like, what do you want to say? And you're like, well, you know, do you want to, you want to get into it? And so we did. And with your help, I was able to move into this emotion. And you even pointed out yesterday, the beauty of it is you just are asking questions and I'm finding it. I'm the one looking for, you're not telling me something I don't know. You're pointing me to myself totally. to find what that thing is that's maybe holding me back. And it was a feeling of not deserving something. I didn't feel like I deserved it. And I don't know how it got there. And we didn't have to go back to how it got there. We didn't have to go back to, you know, three or four or 10 or 15. We didn't have to go there. But what we did was you're like, okay, you know, look at it, feel it and allow it. And I looked at it and well, cause first it's like, what is it? And so we turned and, you know, I turned and looked at it somewhere in my mind and I was like, oh, it's, you know, I, I don't feel like I deserve. And you're like, okay, look at it with love right? Like, how would we do that for someone else? If somebody else was telling us they felt that way, what would we do for them? Yeah. Right. And it's not like, oh, no, 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 you deserve it. It's like, you know, you do deserve it and you are worthy of it. And, and when you look at it with love, instead of resisting it, you can be like, okay. And ever since that day, I feel it show up. It shows up and I'm like, Hey, there you are. Oh, in an action I'm going to take. Right. Because for me, it led to self-sabotaging, like not completing tasks, not doing things that I really want to do to be successful. But this feeling of unworthiness or lack of deserving it is like showing up and preventing me from taking actions. It's like, oh, well, I did it again. I let the thing slip and I didn't do the thing. And then I get to beat myself up and, you know, the whole process over and over again. And so now it's like, okay, I'm feeling resistance to taking this action what's happening? Oh, there you are. I feel you. You are that little bit of unworthiness. Let's look at you. Hey, you're okay. It's okay to feel unworthy, regardless of where it came from. Right. We didn't, I didn't put it there and it's not true. First of all, I'm happy for you. That's so major, you know, to have that kind of new awareness. That's a really big breakthrough. And I think that that's actually something and a tool that we can learn to cultivate within ourselves for some practice or with support, reaching out to a coach or a healer. And it, man, like it helps us be so unstuck, right? Because you felt stuck. You felt like, oh my gosh, you just felt like that energy of like, okay, why am I here again, you know? And to have that gone, like that's so amazing. So I'm just really happy for you. But you wouldn't have been able to, right? Because I didn't tell you how, what you were feeling. I just asked you questions so you can get there. But you would not have been able to get there if you didn't feel like it was a safe environment. So if we are constantly judging ourselves for not being happy, judging ourselves for not being positive, judging ourselves for not being the good person, the, you know, Madonna figure, the pure like lady figure, right? If we are beating ourselves up constantly for not meeting the standard that's imaginary, there is no way 
that we're going to be able to recognize the subconscious fear-based patterns that are actually dictating our actions and creating our reality. So beginning to start to love ourselves, even when we hate the freaking thoughts we're having. Okay. Like I suffer with that a lot. Like I have this tendency to beat myself up for repeating the same patterns, right? Like, oh my gosh, why am I doing that? That's not who I am. Like, and just attaching to it and starting to say, oh no, this is a part of my identity when it really isn't. But when you can love yourself and say, hey, I see what's happening right now. I see what I'm doing internally. And I love you for that. That part of you, I know it's hurting. That part of you feels scared. When you can love it first and create the safe space, then this new level of awareness begins to come out. Yeah, I think about like hypnosis, right? With Sherry was helpful mm-hmm. for me too with that, with with a belief I was holding. But if I hadn't have been willing to look at it, the hypnosis isn't going to work. Yeah. Right. If I, and so I, I love that concept of just really turning that love onto yourself because guess what? Everybody's doing it. You are not alone. You are not the only one beating yourself up. You are not doing as poorly at everything as you might think you are. Right. And also nobody else is thinking that, but you, right? Mm -hmm. Like uh, the, the level of expectations we have for ourselves on things, for ourselves on things, it's, other people aren't really always thinking about the ways we're failing like the way we do. Yeah. And so creating that safe space has to do with it. Even just like you said, the awareness of I'm doing this. I have very high expectations of myself. They might be unreasonably high and that's a part of me. And I don't have to hate that part of me either. I don't have to resist that part of me either, but I can look at it with love and say, okay, Where's that coming from? Why am I having high expectations of myself? Is it because I'm trying to meet what I think everybody else wants? Am I trying to get other people to, you know, approve of me? Like you can really start to even from that aspect, anything that is creating those challenges and that kind of tension inside of us, we can turn a loving eye towards it and start to reflect. Totally. It kind of reminds me of the the shadows episode. And I think this is a great follow up. This episode is a great follow up to that episode. But it's like, those parts of ourselves that we're actually hating could have a good side. But we are so focused on hating the shadow aspects of it that we're not allowing the good side of it to breathe. Having high expectations means might mean that you know when something is really good. You know when there's quality there. You have a really good eye for things. Like that's a gift, right? But when we're beating ourselves up for being a certain way, we don't allow it any breathing room. We don't allow it any space to like let go of the baggage of it and like be, you know, the the more light side of the of this thing that we supposedly hate about ourselves. Um, and I just want to say, you know. We we talk a lot like about the sh- the shadows and these things, the challenges that we're dealing with, right? But you also can create this safe space for yourself around the things you want to achieve, right? So it's not just, oh, I'm sad and depressed or oh, I don't feel good enough or I have a lack of confidence. That's an area and you can take those, you know, t- those different emotions and feelings about yourself but also like what about when you're trying something new when you are being really brave and like like for me singing is something that i've always felt inadequate at and i've always loved doing it but i've never felt good enough and so i started taking voice lessons and it was challenging and it was scary and i had to create a safe space for myself to start playing with it in front of people and in my, in front of my teacher, just standing in front of my, my voice coach and singing is a challenge. And then Hayden came to one of my sessions. And so now I've got someone watching me learn and be, you know, fumble my way through exercises. And that wouldn't be possible. That expansion wouldn't be possible or at least as enjoyable if I wasn't a safe space for myself. If I 
I allowed that, that feeling of insecurity and inadequacy and said, and I'm going to do this anyways. I love that. I think that being your own protector is part of creating a safe space. So having boundaries around things that we are just exploring, or we feel like newborn babies trying to figure out, stumble our way through, right? Walking for the first time, whatever. Um, Being our own protector around that is sometimes required, especially when nobody understands what we're doing, or it might not make sense to the outside world. Like, and we go through life, I'm going to speak, you know, for myself where I had a hard time when I was transitioning into becoming a healer and a coach. What are people going to think? Are people going to understand this? Because I want to be liked. I want to be understood. I don't want to feel like people have weird, bad thoughts about me that misrepresent me, but I'm not responsible for that. And guess what? They're not responsible for like making me feel good about my new career choice. Do you know who, who is responsible for that? It's me. I'm responsible for that. And so I realized that I had to find a place of empowerment within myself and learn how to come back to that place over and over again. Because if you're constantly looking to the outside world for validation, you're going to constantly feel invalidated. There's always someone who's going to be better or further along or, or not get you know, it. Or not get it. Yeah. Yeah. And, it's it's so interesting how it feels when that person is someone close to you who maybe doesn't fully understand or you have a difference of opinion and it's challenging, right? Because you think, gosh, this person that I'm so close with, how do we not see eye to eye on this? And yet we're all such different people, right? I mean, we know this, we know every single one of us is different. And for me, I'm, I mean, I'm even having that experience right now with something where I'm like, wow, I didn't realize, or let me say this, I realized the difference, but now I'm like, oh, it's really obvious to me. We don't have the same idea about this. And then I found myself, it was literally just this morning, starting to create a story about what that means. And I caught myself doing it. And this is something I feel so blessed to be able to do now is to hear the negative thoughts right as they're coming in. And it was like, well, okay, what does that mean? What does it mean about us? What does it mean about me? And then I started having judgments against myself and against the other person. Like, well, you know, you're not open-minded or, well, I can see how we're different, but like, then that means you don't, care about what I think. And if you don't care about what I think, you don't believe in what I'm doing. And if you don't believe in what I'm doing, where does that leave us? Like I just started down this trail of what are all the thoughts that were coming into my head about what that thing meant. And I stopped and I went, you're creating a story right now. You are creating the story about what this interaction means about all kinds of things. And I don't need to do that. I don't have to make it mean something. What it actually means is we both see something in a different way. End of story. That is what it means. What does it feel like? It feels invalidating. And then I can turn to myself and say, why do you feel invalidated? And what I realize is I want to have that level of confidence in my own beliefs such that I don't need someone else to validate that belief for me. And so that was the direction. It was like, oh, the step is becoming my biggest fan, believing in my own self so much that if somebody doesn't believe in it, it's okay. And neither of us has to be wrong because there are thousands of different beliefs out there. That's so empowering. It takes so much courage, I think, and practicing of courage to be in a relationship with somebody, not like I'm saying, not like a romantic relationship or a marriage or partnership, but even friendships, even great friendships, um, and be both in your own power and say, it's okay if you don't see things my way. It's okay if we have different perspectives on things. That's okay, right? Because I think that especially as people with like the big hearts that like 
can feel what other people are feeling. We want so much to be understood because then if we're understood, then we're okay in their book. You know what I mean? But if we don't have control over what everybody thinks about every single thought, about every single belief we carry, and that's okay. And it takes practice to get to this place of having the courage to say, I understand that you see things differently and that's, that's fine. I still really do believe in this right now. This is actually a truth for me. And this is a path that I want to explore. I, I love you, you know, and I'm sure there's other places in the relationship, obviously where you are going to meet and have, you know, what a really great test could be is what are our values? If the values are in line then that relationship can still be really sustainable and healthy and great. And all your beliefs don't have to be the same because the values are that core thing, right? That that might make a bigger difference than the little beliefs because we can have so many beliefs about di- so many different things. It's a kind of impossible to think that one other person is going to share it all. Yeah, I think you and I experience that sometime. We have diverging viewpoints about Things that, whether it's healing or, you know, own personal experiences or whatever. And I love that we have that safe space with each other. But if we hadn't created a safe space for ourselves to have that belief, then someone else having a differing opinion would challenge it. And, and I think sometimes it still does when, when you have a different opinion or, you know, say something in a different way. And I'm like, oh, I look at it and, and have a moment like, okay, am I wrong? Is that, is that try to black and white it? Right. Like the brain tries to be like, is it right or wrong? And like, (laughs) yes, the brain does. Yeah. And, and at the end of the day, it's like, it's just okay to have a different experience and a different viewpoint because it serves us. Yeah. I also love that too, Gina. It's funny you say that. Like, I love that we can be, because I think we're really similar in a lot of ways, which by the way, if you've been listening to us for a while, Gina and I have these really weird synchronicities throughout our life that are so random like, I don't even remember them right now, but do you remember them? Like, okay, we found out last week that, that both your grandfather and my great-grandfather were both Freemasons. Yeah. What are the chances of that? That is not like a normal <laughs> thing. No, our husbands have the same birthday? Is it right? the do same they? birthday? August 10th? 12th. Eric's the 12th. Oh, they're just super, super close. Yeah. <laughs> we, but there's like, that's just the surface. We were both prom queen, which is hilarious. Yep. We we both graduated college the same year. Even though, I was right? a decade <laughs> older than you. Yeah, there's just we a lot of really weird things. Mm-hmm. But anyways, I know. I, there's way more cooler stuff. We'll remember them and share them with you. But but the Freemason one's pretty trippy. That's the new one. That's the new <laughs> one. Add that to the list. No, uh, well, roofs done at the same time. Roofs like, done we at the same time. Roofs. That's right. Car accident same week. Uh huh. What are the chances? Like all these random things. But anyways, <laughs> I also do love that. Like I love being able, and that's something that um, when I meditate with the guides and, you know, think about everyday evolution, they're like, you both need like being in both of your individual fullness is how this works. And that means you're going to be so different from me. I'm going to be so different from you. That's a wonderful thing. And Obviously we have great chemistry. (laughs) It's okay that, that, you know, things are different. I love that. It's like a real mature adult relationship, you know? Well, I, I, if you think about our human design, right, we have like seven channels that complete each other. And the whole point of that is we have something the other doesn't. And when it comes together, it makes this complete flow through that channel where we both offer something to it. And it's not that we're not in wholeness without it. We're each in our wholeness. But when you bring it together, it becomes this you it's know, own thing. This flow. Yeah. It's own thing. Yes. It's pretty cool. So that's how our relationships can be too. You know, other friendships and mm-hmm. partnerships and even right. with our own you children. Can be, you can be in wholeness and be different and have different viewpoints. And I think really at the end of the day, for me, where it starts to become a challenge is when someone expects someone else to be different. 
Yeah. That's where it's, and so where's that coming from? Why do you need somebody to be different? Why do you need somebody? Or respond to things a certain way, the way we would respond to things. It's like, no, you know? Yeah. I think that that that's where the tension comes in. It's not at being different. It's what you do with that difference. And that's where creating a safe space for yourself to be who you are and then to also allow others to be who they are. Yeah. And then when others have a different opinion, it doesn't challenge you because you're not making it about you. Yeah. I've noticed that the more you can be your own safe space, the more, well, for you personally, so maybe it works backwards for some people, which would be fine, but the more I'm able to be a safe space for others. So even yesterday with Cecilia, I just dropped down into this really grounded place, right? And I just wrapped my arms around her and I just knew I couldn't control everything she was doing. That, was at, that wasn't me. That was her, right? But I put my arms around her and I, for, as I didn't have, like, she wasn't even listening to me for the first minute. Like, she was just on this pure panic state. But I was able to just say, hey, look me in the eye everything's going to be okay. Like I just find that I can be that more for other people. And it's because I've been working on and it's still not perfect, right? I think this is all the stuff that we're talking about. Like these are lifelong journeys. This is big stuff. This is things that take decades and decades and decades to really get good at. But it's about the practice that um, is really the learning ground. And so just, I've just noticed my, ability within my own interpersonal relationships to be that for them better than I could have been before when I couldn't even have safety within my own, you know, soul. Yeah, for sure. Well, and I love how you said, right, that it's a lifelong practice. And that's where a lot of times we recognize something in ourselves, some discord, some energetic way of being that we don't enjoy and we maybe turn and face it. Oh, here I am. I don't feel worthy of success and I'm going to fix that today. (laughs) Right. And here's how I'm going to fix it. It's going to look like this. It's going to take this long. And then I'll, and then I'll have succeeded right at fixing it. It's like, that's just that whole approach takes away everything we're talking about, which is, holding a safe space for it to unwind the way that it needs to unwind in its own time. Yeah. Time is a funny one because I'll find that if I'm ever caught, you know, my ego is trying to take a hold of me and I'm caught in some fear about some stuff, maybe like past kind of traumatic stuff or something that I'm like, Oh, it's, you know, just today, like today is just a bad day. And you know what? Maybe it will be just today, but I do try to just be like, you're only allowed Christina one day to have these thoughts. And it's like, if you think you're ever going to fully have control over e- your ego, it, you don't. It's it's something that you learn to have a relationship with. So what I've learned in that relationship with my mind and these more negative or intense emotions is that they, the more I allow them to be, again, the faster they do go, but they will come back around sometimes. And this could be a very long process like that. If it's a really big thing, maybe it will take, you know, a decade and every now and then it, it pops its head back up and is asking for your attention again, or really trying to get a hold of you. And just having patience with that, instead of letting, letting it mean something about you, um, mean that you're regressing or you're not doing things right or something like that, I think will get you a lot further along than fighting it. Yeah. It's not a failure. It's not a failure to have the thing pop up again, particularly when you recognize it, like recognize yourself for the progress of seeing it come up again. Oh, there's that thing, or I'm doing this again and pat yourself on the back. Hey, I noticed that, you know, I'm, I am making progress, however small or big it is doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you are stepping into a place where you feel more whole 
by just making this one little decision, this recognizing this one little habit that is affecting your relationships with yourself or with other people. It's a gift. It's such a, it, like you said, it's so empowering to start seeing those things and refining your relationship with them. That old saying that your thoughts aren't you is just coming up right now. Like what, why is that so hard to accept? <laughs> your thoughts aren't you. Like we, if my thoughts were me, I would be like a crazy person, you know, like my life would be, <laughs> I have a weird head, you guys, like I'm serious. Our thoughts aren't us. It's, it's what we choose to feed what we choose to focus on. And so if we're like, I am such a bad person, I like, and you keep feeding that belief over and over and over again, like I promise you're probably going to start having little actions that validate that belief that you have. You're going to start doing things that prove it to you. That's what's going to happen. That's just like what Gino was talking about earlier, like the, the sabotage. It's like, I'm going to carry this belief and it's going to play out. And I don't even know that I'm doing it, but it's really because I have this internal dialogue that I keep believing over and over and over again. Yeah. That one's tricky. I think it's such a beautiful reminder that our thoughts aren't, aren't us and yet they create our reality. Yeah. They aren't who we actually are and yet they create who we become right? Like they, they really do that. Like, like you said, you follow this thought, this belief about yourself and, and conscious or subconscious. That's the other part, right? Is like, yes, there are these conscious things that we can talk about. And then there are the, the other bits that are running under the surface, right? And sometimes how you're feeling is what's going to point you to that. Sometimes a, a pattern that's showing up in your life is what's going to encourage you to start to explore what's behind that. But I am not unworthy. I mean, how do you even be that? What does that even fucking mean? I know. <laughs> totally. <Right>? I wonder <laughs> if the whole, your thoughts aren't you and yet they inform your reality. It kind of feels paradoxical, but when I wonder if it's because as we explained, your thoughts aren't you, right? Because the mind is always trying to keep us safe. There's a lot of fear-based thoughts running subconsciously that's going to keep you your, your nervous system under control and regulate and all that. But at the same time, there's almost like if you can begin to have a relationship with your ego and learn how to work it in the right way or learn when to control it, then you can start to have thoughts that are really coming from your heart. So they're not coming from the fear-based part of you. Those thoughts can come from your heart and they can say, hey, you know that business that you've been wanting to start because this is your lifelong passion? You can do that. Because those thoughts, they're going to be expressed in our head too. Those are beautiful and valid and true and amazing. And those will begin to inform our, I would rather have my reality be informed from those thoughts, right? Than from those fear-based thoughts. It's so funny. Just before you said that, I was thinking about the connection to the heart. Like that really is the, the heart and, and our gut, you know, the gut has its place in our, in our information system, but, oh, when you connect with your heart for your thoughts and your beliefs. And that feels like where a lot of that reframing starts to happen, right? Is the, your, your heart is telling you when you step out of the mind to connect with what your truth is, it really does live there. And for me, it's a feeling. There's just, it's a feeling of connecting to my heart and making choices based in that space, connected with my higher self. Right. And, and I think sometimes we think the higher self is like, I don't know, this up above thing or whatever, but it really is. It's that connection to your heart, to your soul's truth. And as, as you do that, as you start to tune your thoughts and actions from that place, I think you can be, you, you do become your thoughts that way. 
I think I'm going to start calling it like the inner self or something. Cause you're right. The mm. higher self feels like it's above you and it's really hard to access it. But the heart is actually that energetic doorway to that realm, to the spirit realm, to your soul, basically like the, that dimension of purity and truth that your soul is in. That's where we access it. And creating safety, I think, includes nurturing that connection, nurturing the connection to our inner self, to our intuition, right? But that takes time. So Mm -hmm. one thing we can ask ourselves is like, are we allowing ourselves space? And I mean, come on, like as moms, as women, modern women, that's a hard thing to do. Like you really have to schedule that shit <laughs> if it's going to get done, right? <laughs> like even just five minutes for meditating, but nurturing that stillness so we can feel the heart. It's going to do so much for our lives for that very reason. Then we can start to hear those thoughts better than the thoughts of the ego. Yeah, absolutely. I think it'll, our life can change pretty quickly that way. Yeah, well, it changes how you see things when you're coming from that heart space. It definitely, and and even more so how you see yourself, how you connect with things when you're coming from that heart space. So I love that. My heart feels really open right now. And what a great conversation. Like, it just, I need this right now too, like with that reminder to be my own safe space, especially when you're trying new things and Things are not in your wheelhouse or you're pushing your own boundaries, exploring new territory, maybe going through something difficult. This is just a reminder that you can be that safe place of validation, of being seen, of being witnessed, of being heard. You can do that for yourself. And it might surprise you that as you start doing that for yourself, you might begin to see the world mirror that back to you. And so just a couple notes of bullet points that we had talked about, um, just allowing, allowing the feelings and the thoughts that you wish you weren't feeling to just be sometimes and allowing them the time and the space and understand that this isn't something that we get to schedule, right? In our calendar, that maybe it's going to take some time and just having patience and grace for yourself along the way and loving that part of you that has those feelings wrapping that part of yourself. If you want to see it like a child, or if you want to see it like your current, current form, whatever, just bringing love to yourself around it and understanding that it's not all of you, that these feelings and thoughts are not your wholeness are not your whole being. They're just coming from the mind and that's okay. Um, yeah. So actually Gina's going to walk us through a little meditation, which is super exciting to help you guys. What are you going to do? What are you calling it, Gina? Um, the ground of being, it's really connecting, I guess is with that inner self. It kind of connects the, the higher energy, the divine, but you really, what I love about this exercise and this meditation is that it connects you with what it feels like to be in your own essence. And from that space, when you walk around and you feel like you're in your own essence, you can tap back into it at any time. You can go back and be like, oh, this is what it feels like to be me. And then in situations when maybe you are feeling challenges, either during the situation or after, you can return to that. Oh my God, my stomach. I'm so sorry. It's okay. <clears throat> you can return to that feeling and that that sense of being in your own essence. And I feel like that helps do what we're talking about to really connect in with your heart and, and what it is that is your truth. And it's from this place that's not based in judgment of others or anything. It's literally just this connection with like your pure truth and your pure essence. And it feels so good. I love it. (laughs) I love that too. Being empowered in our own energy is critical. Yeah. And just, you know, don't do it while you're driving. <laughs> you might, or you can do it with your eyes open, right? Of course. But I think if you can just take a moment, it's pretty short. And this is something that once we've done this together, you can do it on your own to just take a moment and reconnect with that. So 
Well, I'll say bye here and just listen to this. We'll end the episode after this. That way people can kind of pick up what they want. So thank you everybody so much for listening and enjoy the meditation with Gina. <laughs> All right. So wherever you're sitting, laying down, or just being in this moment, forgetting everything that's happened before and anything that's coming, just come into presence with where you are right now, feel your body having contact with the chair or wherever you are and down in your feet. If you can just feel the energy in your feet and the energy and support from the earth coming up and tingling or just feeling the pressure, the presence of earth and grounding, you're feeling so connected and let the energy just move up your body, move up your legs, your knees, your thighs, your hips, moving up through your chakras, your lower chakras, and up through your stomach and your heart space. Feel the energy coming down your arms to your fingertips and back up to your shoulders, through your throat, and your third eye, and the top of your head. And if you imagine at the top of your head, just this opening that is your crown chakra and being open to let the divine come in to your body, just creating that open connection with the divine, however you identify with it, knowing that we are all divine beings. We are all created of the same things of love and that this guidance is here for us, this beautiful connection. And so if you just see the white or golden light coming in through your crown chakra and let it just come in and fill up your body, coming down through your body the same way that the energy came up, going through your throat, your arms, your chest, your heart down through your legs and through your feet. And now, if you can just imagine that with this beautiful open connection of the light of the divine, <clears throat> of the light of the divine and the support of the earth, you're grounded and sparkly and you've got all this beautiful energy going through you. If you'll see through the top of your head, just this beam of light, coming straight down from source and it comes down through your head down in the front side of your throat in the front of your spine and just imagine this beam of light shooting down through your feet and just sit with this energy feeling the connection and that beam of light that just goes right through you that is your ground of being that is your true essence, that feeling that you can connect with. It's connecting your human body with all of the other energy that's happening. And it's creating this beautiful directed light, this beautiful direction of energy that's just filled with power and beauty and your own true essence that you can carry out into the world. And your truth lives here, the truth of who you are. And if you can feel it, feel it not only through your whole body, but especially just in that heart space, you can put your hand on your chest, connect it into the heart space, and just know that you are your own guide and that your truths live here. And you can connect into this to make decisions, to create a safe haven for yourself, for your being. You can be that space that doesn't have to hide from your shadows and doesn't have to hide from your desires of becoming something beautiful and great because you really are already beautiful and great. You just have layers that keep you from realizing it. And so just connect in with that heart space and tell yourself, thank you. Thank you for showing up. 
thank you for wanting to be exactly who you are meant to be in this lifetime. And you can just express gratitude for the ability to connect into this beautiful part of yourself, knowing that it can guide you on your way anytime you want. Just take a deep breath and sigh. And you can sit in this space for as long as you want. And just know that you can return here anytime you want. And I love you. And I think you should tell yourself how much you love yourself too. Thank you. <laughs>